I will invite uh, Ms. Milena butcher miklaucic to start her, her presentation now uh, because she has to leave uh, at six o'clock. Um, so due to this uh, slight change, uh, our next speaker is, as I said, Milena butcher miklaucic She's from Science and Research Center Cooper Institute for Olive Oil Culture. Um, uh, at the beginning, we have to emphasize that olive growing in Slovenia's littoral Primorska region has a long history. The extra virgin olive oil from Slovenian Istra was the first Slovenian product registered as PDO in EU register. Professional and research assistance is provided by the highly specialized laboratory working predominantly in the field of olive oil quality and authenticity. Before we listen to the next presentation, I invite you all to watch a short thematic video. Everyone in the world loves olive oil. You don't have to be a chef to know you can use it in thousands of ways. What's more, not only does extra virgin olive oil have a unique flavor and smell, but it's also rich in healthy nutrients. Unfortunately, like many other high-value foods, olive oil has become a target for food fraud. So how do we know the olive oil we buy is really what it says on the label? Currently, the EU requires each member state to carry out regular sampling for olive oil quality and authenticity. With over 20 different types of lab checks, as well as tasting sessions with expert panels to ensure there are no sensory defects. While these measures offer great safety, it is essential that regulators continue to update their processes and methods of analysis in order to keep fighting food fraud. The EU-funded project Olium is leading the way in these advances. Olium aims to identify a set of shared best practices aiming to prevent and detect olive oil fraud and to provide validated methods and reference materials for all European and international control and legislative bodies. Olium has established a global network of laboratories and other relevant stakeholders to enhance the validation of its new analytical methods. Olium will also create an online data sharing platform to allow for efficient resource sharing among stakeholders from around the world. Europe is the world's largest olive oil producer. Ensuring the highest quality and authenticity of olive oil on the market is vital to maintaining consumer trust and the high popularity of olive oil. For more information about the Olium project, visit our website. Olium. Better solutions to protect olive oil quality and authenticity. So, Milena butcher miklaucic the floor is yours. So, thank you. Hello to everyone. Please. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Better, better. So uh, thank you, Daria. Uh, as we say, we are the Mediterranean part of Slovenia, and uh, olive trees and olive oil is the traditional products uh, from our area. So in the last uh, next 25 years, we have built a research re research group which is occupied of quality of olive oil and the research in this field. Uh, if you will see the lab, uh, this lab is national accredited and also international accredited. Uh, we are uh, IOC recognized. IOC, it means International Olive Oil Council, which uh, is the, our, uh, our, situ our agency. Uh, not only the chemical laboratory, uh, also the sensory analysis is very important for quality of, of olive oil. So we have also national accredited and international recognized uh, sensory lab. This is was the, the, the aims or this is the, for this we involved in this project. Uh, if we see 
the oleum is focused on olive oil. So it's normally that uh, we can col collaborate it with all these labs in the world to assuring the quality and authenticity of olive oil. And uh, the introduction, we see the, uh, in the, in the video. And the Olean Consortium is comprised of 21 partners, uh, which are very different. Uh, there are a lot of labs, and, uh, but uh, they are also the engineering with uh, bioinformatics and also the stakeholders. The project is coordinated by Tulia Toschi from the University of Bologna from Italy. So we see the Olium Consortium uh, that uh, a lot of partners is in the Europe, but uh, we have also in Argentina and in Israel and in China, uh, the laboratory which uh, collaborated in this consortium. Objectives of the project is to develop new and or improved analytical methods for assuring the quality and authenticity of volume oil. To develop the Olum data bank, to develop and support a worldwide community of proficient analytical laboratories involved in this analysis of volume oil, therefore establishing a wide Olum network. But why is so important to guarantee the quality and authenticity of olive oil? We have a lot of products by olive oil. The annual report placed olive oils as a vulnerable for products for fraud. The high price of olive oil, the distinctive sensory profile, and its reputation as a healthy source of dietary fats also make olive oils target for adulteration or illegal blending, or deliberate mislabeling or less expensive classes of olive oils. So the top, the, the European Food Fraud Report, uh, take the fats and oil become the first frauded uh, product. And this was also the reason that uh, we must uh, take the new method for, uh, for notify the fraud. Uh, why olive oil? Because it's uh, very good for health. It, may, it means the olive oil has health claims. It's uh, the unique product, uh, product of fats which has the health claims. Also, it is very known that the health benefits of olive oil. And this is the reason that uh, that is a lot of fraud in this, uh, in the, in this sector. Europe is kind of the largest producers of olive oil. Uh, it's more than 70% of the world's production. But, uh, and in the last year, in the last 10 years, we see that uh, uh, the rise, the, the production of olive oil. In the other hand, also the consumption of, of olive oil is uh, rising. So you see the, in the graph, uh, there are uh, no only the European country members which uh, have the production uh, in the next, in last 10 years so, so big, is also non-European uh, non countries. And the problem is that, uh, the, her, that we need the harmonization of the standards and the harmonization of legislation. Why? Because uh, it's important to seek uh, uniformity in national and international legis legislation because you see the difference uh, of the quality parameters, the different of categories in the world. It means uh, that we have um, in, 
in codex standards different with European standards. And uh, in Australia is very different. So uh, the aims of the project was also how to harmonize this uh, criteria for quality, but also for authenticity. Uh, in, in Europe, we have four uh, category of different olive oil. Only extra virgin and virgin olive oil are the category of virgin oil. But in other parts of the world, it has the third virgin uh, category, which is, cat is, virgin, uh, is virgin olive oil, corrente. And uh, this make uh, mis a little disharmony in the, in the market. And uh, so because of that, it's very important to harmonize legislation, but also the standards. Uh, research activity based on the development of improved or new methods by targeted uh, approaches with the aim. It was to detect new markers of soft deodorization process, to discover illegal blends, to control um, olive oil quality, freshness, to improve the organoleptic ass assessment with a quantity of panel test. What means the, in the sector of olive oil, the sensory analysis is very important because uh, with sensory analysis, you classify it in the category, such as in wine sector. And uh, it's uh, very important that, that this, this method, it's not so subjective that you put it in objective, in objective means. Uh, it's a lot of material in the, in the web, so uh, if, some of, of you is interesting to, to see uh, the outcome of this project you can share uh, in, in, in the web. Uh, the final conference, it, it was on February. It means uh, two months ago. And uh, I can briefly go to the outcomes. Uh, there are the six new analytical methods for authenticity, but another uh, 10 methods with, uh, which are uh, support to the uh, panel analysis or to other uh, fra fraud analysis. Uh, we our institute is uh, working a lot of bio, uh, on the segment of biophenols. Biophenols are very good antioxidants. So this is, uh, we validated two methods in this uh, field. So I think that it was very good collaboration with uh, the other labs and uh, the new protocol we proposed for, uh, uh, health claims because uh, the health claims uh, did not have the method uh, with, with which we can uh, certify the these claims. Uh, the other is the panel test, uh, uh, which we have a lot of uh, apply, applied. A new method for volatility component, and uh, uh, we have uh, flash gas chromatography, and uh, I think that is uh, very good support uh, to check the panel, the sensory panel. Uh, also, we have uh, new reference materials for the sensory analysis. This is very difficult uh, because. Uh, the olive oil, olive oils has a lot of component and uh, they we must choose uh, the the main uh, component which uh, create one defect uh, 
Uh, but if you wish to go uh, on the web, you see how our olive oil is produced. Uh, you see how it must be olive oil labeling and uh, a lot of publication. I think that is uh, near 30 or 40 uh, scientific uh, publication. And uh, in the final conference, it was very, very successful, successful because we have over 320 people attending the final conference. But I think that is very good that we have uh, a big and uh, very good Olum network. Mm -hmm. So uh, who is the Olum network? You see here uh, there, uh, there are 103 members from 22 different countries. And I think that is very good and that is very good for collaboration and uh, for new innovation. So you can see also in Twitter or all, all online and uh, sorry, I must go and thank you for your attention. Enjoy the extra video all you all and came in Slovenia in this part of Med of this Mediterranean part of Slovenia. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Milena, for this uh, uh, for this very very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, before you leave, uh, I would have just one short question, and that would be: How did you become a partner in um, this this consortium? Uh, what is your story? No, because we are very known lab in 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 um, international olive oil council. It means we are recognized, and there are a lot of members. There are forty four members in IOC, which is occupied on olive culture, on olive growing, on olive oil. So uh, this is the first contact. We have uh, very very good contact with IOC, and. Uh, also from the other project, because we are uh, the project such as Interreg Italia Slovenia, because we are near the border and um, we do something, uh, a lot of project, uh, which we training the, the panel, the sensory analysis, we, 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 with the education of in, in the uni university and so, so on. I think that is very good to, to have this kind of collaboration. Uh, thank you for your reply. I see uh, uh, Mr. Renato would ask, like to ask for the floor. So please proceed with your question, Mr. Renato. Uh, thank you for your, your presentation. I just would like to know if it's possible to uh, identify uh, who are the participants of the Olion Brazilian participants of the Olean uh, network. No, it, it's uh, I collaborated with Argentinian uh, because the Argentinian lab is in the in the in the IOC and uh, we have straight collaboration with them. Uh, I can try to to see i don't know which is the brazilian but uh, i can send the communication if you wish it's no problem thanks okay melina we will uh, get in touch with you and uh, ask yes, you to prepare yes, this yes. reply and then contact mr renato and send and provide Sorry for, for confusion and so what but <laughs> you know not a problem uh, we thank you for your collaboration for your participation and we understand you have to leave at six so thank you for being okay. with us this even short time um we will uh, we will now continue bye -bye. with bye bye we will now continue with our program. Um, I apologize sincerely to uh, Professor Dermastia, who should be the first speaker in this uh, part of the program, but still unexpected things happen. So um, I announce now uh, the next speaker, Professor Marina Dermastia from National Institute of uh, Biology in Ljubljana, Slovenia. Professor Marina Dermastia has more than 30 years of um, Slovenian and international experiences in studying molecular interactions between plant pathogens and plants. Uh, currently, she's in a group leader of the 
Phytoplasma Research Laboratory at National Institute of Biology, which is a globally recognized for its basic phyto phytoplasma studies, as well as for developing new molecular methods for their detection. She was invited here today to present the project Tropic Safe based on her fruitful cooperation with leading phytoplasma teams from all continents. So, Professor Dermastia, the floor is yours. Buenas tardes a todos. Soy Marina Dermastia del Instituto Nacional de Biología. En los próximos minutos voy a presentar el proyecto Tropic Safe. Okay. This was my forage. And first, I would like to invite you to Costa Rica, which is my favorite uh, place in uh, Latin America. But uh, actually, this is not the part of our project. And uh, let me give a second to share the, my presentation. Ah, OK. So uh, the tropic associated diseases in tropical and subtropical perennial crops. This is a project uh, uh, related, associated with uh, Horizon 2020. Uh, it uh, started in 2017 and it should be finished this year, but due to the COVID situation, it was just recently prolonged for another year. So the overall budget of this project is about uh, four million dollars of uh, euros. Sorry. So the consortium uh, coordinator is Professor Assunta Bertaccini from the uh, University of Bologna. Obviously, the Italians are very active in this uh, European project, and we have quite a big consortium, uh, which uh, consists of uh, academics, research centers, uh, foundations, SMEs, uh, and uh, several producer associations. So uh, we have quite some partners from Latin America, uh, especially uh, from university. We have University of Chile from uh, Santiago de Chile, and uh, Colpo from Mexico. Then we have one research center from Mexico, from Merida. Uh, and we have uh, one uh, research center from Cuba and uh, uh, producers from Jamaica, Chile, Mexico, and from Guadalupe. We also have uh, quite big stakeholders advisory boards with really a lot of stakeholders. And uh, let's go to the project. As I said, the project addresses very dangerous insect borne and prokaryote associate diseases of coconut, which is coconut little yellowing, then uh, grapevine, and the diseases that we study is uh, grapevine yellows. And uh, we studied also citruses and the disease uh, for long bink or uh, citrus greens. So all those diseases affect uh, the trade and uh, import of uh, agricultural products and materials worldwide. Uh, and in our project, we are focused on tropical and subtropical areas in Africa, Latin America, Caribbean, and subtropical regions of Europe. So uh, here are our studied areas. Uh, you can see that uh, there is quite uh, some places in uh, Latin America and Central America. So we have our studied areas in Mexico, Cuba, Jamaica, Guadeloupe, and in Chile. But also we have two studied areas in Ghana and South Africa, and a uh, few in, in Europe, uh, especially in Spain, Italy, and uh, in Slovenia. 
So uh, our project develops evidence-based and robust prevention and management measures over the target diseases in order to reduce both local losses and threats in the agro industry. And uh, according to our consortium, uh, you can see that there is really a strong collaboration between EU and non-EU partners uh, in this project. The main goal is to provide innovative tools and solutions to manage and reduce the impact of target crop diseases. So I have mentioned the diseases. Uh, I have also mentioned the crops, but here in this table, you have uh, also the pathogen and the insect vectors of those pathogens. So the main pathogens of our research are Candidatus phytoplasma palmicola uh, in coconut, for which the insect vector is not known. And we also have another phytoplasma uh, with the insect vector uh, Haplexius crudus. Uh, so uh, we are looking also for another vectors uh, of coconut and also possible another pathogens of coconut. So in citruses, uh, we are studying Candidatus liberibactor asiaticus, africanus, and americanum. For, uh, for all of these pathogens, the insect vectors are known, but we are also looking for uh, new ones. And uh, for grapevine, we are studying uh, Candidatus phytoplasma asteris, solani, praxini, pruni, and uh, we also have quite a list of known uh, insect vectors and we are looking for new ones. So the specific objectives of our project uh, are obtaining updated data and information of those of these diseases to generate new and deeper knowledge on epidemiological cycles to develop advanced and new integrated pest management strategies to obtain cost and environmental impact reduction of phytosanitary controls and to evaluate socioeconomic sustainability and feasibility of new technologies and new pest management strategies. It would be obvious to assume that we are mostly involved in grapevine diseases, but uh, this is not entirely true because Tropic Safe develops evidence based and robust prevention and management measures toward the target diseases. We are also working on development of molecular diagnostic methods for all studied diseases, uh, including uh, the validation of new developed protocols. However, our main task, I mean our Slovenian main, main task is associated with developing protocols for the on-site detection of phytoplasmas and uh, most likely you don't know what uh, phytoplasmas are. So these are the, the smallest known bacteria, both according to their genome size and according to uh, their uh, cell size. What I mean with the small size, they are uh, the, in the size of uh, big viruses. So for... Uh, many, many decades uh, until 19th of the previous century, all phytoplasma diseases uh, were uh, in studies associated with viruses. And so we only recently know that these are really bacteria, but uh, they behave somehow like viruses. So we are not able to culture them so we can detect and study them only in the plant which is really hard and uh, which means that detection methods are really, really uh, uh, specific and only based on molecular protocols. However, our research group at the National Institute of Biology in Ljubljana is globally recognized for development of molecular detection protocols for 
phytoplasmas, and we are also part of the consortium of EU reference laboratories for phytoplasma diagnostic, and our lab is also national reference laboratory for phytoplasmas. Uh, in our research, we are very, I mean, research in this tropic safe project, we are very much focused on grapevine yellows diseases caused by phytoplasmas. And in uh, tropic safe, I am a coordinator for all grapevine yellows developing protocols. Uh, phytoplasmas uh, have really specific uh, symptomatic on grapevine. So, uh, the symptoms include yellowing or reddening of leaf blades, but this depends on the cultivar of uh, grapevine. So those uh, symptoms are yellows, yellowing uh, on uh, white varieties and red, uh, reddish on red varieties. Uh, the infected grapevines uh, show this downward curling of leaves. Uh, the important symptom is lack or incomplete in lignification of shoots. Uh, and most important, of course, for a vine producer is the abortion of inflorescence. And uh, in the case when, infl when inflorescence uh, started to develop, uh, usually we have the shriveling of berries. So there is uh, no yield and uh, Phytoplasmas are really one of the most dangerous uh, grapevine diseases uh, worldwide. And especially this is important in Europe uh, where uh, grapevine is one of the most important crops. But what is important uh, to uh, emphasize is that all symptoms of grapevine yellows are uh, very similar and are not uh, dependent on the uh, causing phytoplasma. So uh, we have a lot of unrelated phytoplasmas all around the world that cause the same uh, symptoms on grapevine. But of course, because they are not taxonomically related, we need to develop uh, specific detection methods for each specific phytoplasma. And this is the idea of uh, this project. So uh, within Tropic Safe, we collaborate mostly with Chile and South Africa for the obvious reason. These are the only out of Europe wine producing countries in our consortium. And uh, like in Europe, phytoplasmas have a great economic impact on their wine industry. So uh, there is really a strong uh, input in developing new molecular methods for detecting uh, phytoplasmas in uh, Chile and of course also in South Africa where uh, in, in Chile, we collaborate with the University of Chile in Santiago and in South Africa with the University of Stellenbosch in, in uh, Cape region. So uh, during the project, we are all the time producing uh, scientific and technological fact sheets, which will be bound together in the handbook uh, after the project will be finished next year, but uh, all those fact sheets are already uh, published. Uh, you can find them on our Tropic Safe uh, web page. Uh, here are only two examples of these fact sheets uh, in which uh, our laboratory was involved. So we prepared the reference material for molecular testing of Candidatus phytoplasma solani for all partners all around the globe. And uh, in uh, an additional uh, fact sheet, we, pre we prepared uh, uh, some uh, new facts about epidemiology of phytoplasmas associated with grapevine yellows in South Africa, Chile, and Italy. So, uh, 
the most important uh, target group in our project are the, the producers. So we, we collaborate with them very tightly and we have several training sessions. Uh, we had several training sessions planned, but uh, actually in vivo, let's say in vivo, we had only one. And this was exactly one year ago in uh, Merida in Yucatan. Uh, so uh, this was the training session, how to use uh, lamp uh, methodology for uh, palms. Unfortunately, because of uh, coronavirus, is our training, uh, this year training session in uh, South Africa was postponed and uh, we still hope uh, that we'll go to Guadeloupe uh, next year, but who knows, we'll see. However, we have a lot of webinars instead of these uh, live uh, training sessions and uh, uh, you can find all these uh, methods uh, nicely described on our YouTube channel, like this uh, loop mediated isothermal amplification of nucleate acids uh, for which uh, our lab is, I think, one of the best on the world. So in short, that was all from my side uh, and I'd be happy to uh, answer any question if there are any. And you have here my address and there is a Tropic Safe web page and uh, you can contact me anytime if you have further. Um, prof Professor Dermastia, thank you very much for your in-depth uh, presentation. Um, I'm looking at the list of analysts and attendees. Uh, I don't see no one is asking for the floor or are there any questions for Professor Dermastia at this point? Um, maybe I would have one question, and this would be, since this project Tropic Safe is um, tackling tropical and subtropical countries, um, how is this important for Slovenia, since we are neither of those, those countries? Um, maybe you could explain this a little bit for us. Yeah, yeah I, I think that this is really a good question. But uh, during the preparation of Tropic Safe uh, proposal, I learned uh, that uh, grapevine is actually classified as subtropical crop. So uh, we were actually in from the beginning. So we were not uh, uh, forced to, to uh, imagine anything uh, or that. So the, the grapevine was uh, important crop in this region. But on the other hand, we are developing methods for all kinds of pathogen. And because we are working mostly or mainly on, on these um, molecular methods, it really doesn't matter which patho pathogen is involved. So uh, we are working on their DNA. And uh, so we can work uh, all around the planet. Okay, thank you very much for this also additional explanation. Um, and then well, I thank you very much for again for your presentation. And now we move to a little bit another field. We move to archaeology. Our next speaker is uh, Benjamin Stuller. He comes from Research Center of Slovenian Academy of Science and Arts. Um, the project uh, that he will present provides international cohesion between 41 partners from four continents and external connectivity to existing research platforms. For example, it provides a portal with a catalog of archeological data sets available online and virtual, research environments for data focused archeology. span As this seems very interesting, we invited Professor Stuller to share with us his experience and insights with the project Ariadne Plus. So, Professor Stuller, the floor is yours.
Um, thank you very much. Um, can you see my my screen? Yes, um, yes, we can. Okay. Okay, so um, I wanna I wanna thank good afternoon. I would like to thank the organizer for inviting us to present our project and to all the participants for your perseverance and your attention. Um, I will be presenting the Horizon 2020 project for Yadne Plus, but there are three other people that have co-authored this presentation, um, Sheena Bassett, Franco Nicolucci, and uh, Julian Richards. If I would only have one minute to present the project, I would say it's connecting the past to open up the future. Currently, we have more than a minute, um, so we can start at the beginning. In Greek mythology, Daphne is a daughter of Minos and Physique of Crete, and she gave to Zeus the threat with which he found the way out of the labyrinth. To this day, we associate Ariadne's threat with solving a problem by applying logic in all available routes. And this, this is where our project from biological data set networking in your research infrastructure for geology. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I've lost connection a bit, um, I'm back. So let's continue. Um, one of the grand challenges of data intensive science is to facilitate knowledge discovery. Um, um, and life before Ariadne for archaeology was this. And th these, are, these are screenshots from several dozens of individual um, online databases that an archaeologist needed to use in order to get the information. Um, and now within the project, um, um, we, we have many partners and we are able to provide, um, and Argentina is one of the partners. And um, what Ariadne does is links the partners internally this is the circle in the middle. It provides cohesion, but it also provides connection to other um, infrastructures, uh, for example, European Open Science Cloud, etc. Our main goal, you could say, is making data fair. Fair means findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, this is very important because um, often scientists or researchers are criticized that we do not provide our data. But it's not just making, um, when we finish with the research, we cannot just dump our data somewhere to some server and it would immediately live on. Um, there's quite a bit of work that needs to be uh, done before that happens. And this is one of the things that we do in the project. And what's the end goal? The end goal is one or one of the main aims is this. This is called Ariadne portal and it's a search portal for um, archaeological data of all the partners and hopefully at some point um, of um, majority of all um, relevant archaeology. Within the project, we are trying to extend geographically and uh, to different languages. And we are also trying to increase metadata richness and standardization. Now, standardization is the key word here. This, for example, and our main tool is what we call Ariadne reference model, which is based on CDOC CRM model. I know that, um, that, that there's probably not many data scientists um, among you. So um, let's have a look at a simplified example. Let's imagine that we have one database on ancient sculptures, one database on paintings, and one database on archeological finds. In the first column, you see um, under ancient sculptures, there are sculptors, under paintings, there are painters, and so on. But, what, but now what we're trying to do is merge 
um, these three databases so that they can be discovered. And um, this is done um, in a process where, for example, in this case, um, the sculpture, the painter and the excavator, they are all made known. They're um, our database search engine knows them as author. So now when we look for the author, we will get the sculpture and the painter. Now, this doesn't sound that complicated, but bear in mind that, that there are dozens of databases, there are thousands of types of data and millions of data points. So this, the whole task becomes more complicated. And this is just a snapshot into our interoperability framework. And immediately it gets quite complicated. So this is just a diagram of the um, processing pipeline of merging our data, of preparing our data um, so that we are able to use it in, in Ariadne portal. Um, so let's have a look, yeah, and um, to merge it in Ariadne portal, which is what we mentioned. But now here's the question that we get most often. Why bother? Just Google it. Um, I use the term Google here as a verb, so it applies to all the major search engines. Um, and it's a valid question, it's a good question. And many of us take it for granted that Google search or any other search engine just works. There is, and we take the results as valid without bothering to wonder what's going on behind. But there's a lot going on behind. Um, so for us to be able to find something so quick, search algorithms need to sort the data. And this data is sorted um, in, for example, in Google, for in Google's example, by what's called Google ranking systems. And these systems are designed to sort hundreds or billions of web pages. Um, and obviously they're doing this with um, um, the goal to serve the most common searches. Um, here's a list of the, um, well, um, actually the, the list of seven or eight most common search uses um, according to a research by Becklinko. Um, and of course, none of them is science, let alone archeology. span No one, Google will not develop um, search engine for archeology. span um, And, and uh, in addition for some data, so for example, only 9% of Google search make it to the bottom of the first page and only less than half percent of searchers go to the second page. And anyone who's tried to um, set up their own um, web page knows how difficult it is to get to the first page of Google Hits. Even if the search is very specific to what you're doing, it's very unlikely that you'll be on the top of the first page unless you have invested a lot time, effort, money, I'm talking millions, into your web service. Um, so what does that mean for, uh, for the researchers? It's very difficult for a researcher to find relevant results. And when we do find them, um, we, we need to make additional checks um, on, um, on, um, we to verify the scientific reliability of, of that data. And of course, um, we have no influence on how the search is conducted because that's a, um, that um, that's, uh, remains a secret, a well hidden secret. Um, and of course, we are not um, um, in developing Ariadne portal, we are not trying to compete with Google. That would be ludicrous. It was mentioned earlier that the entire budget for Horizon 20, uh, for you know, Horizon Europe for seven years, it's gonna be 95 billion euros. That may sound a lot, but let me assure you that Google's budget just for research um, and maintenance of their uh, search engine is far bigger than that. So of course um, we are not competing in it. So what are we doing? Let's take, um, let's have a look at an example. Let's have a look at a car. Everybody knows cars, right? So let's imagine this state of the art, everyone wants it car. Uh, it's great in most conditions, it will work perfectly in most conditions, but not all conditions. There are definitely some niche specific conditions when the car on the top of your image will just not work 
and you need a very niche product, a very specific product, and that's what we are developing. So, fi um, uh, so finally, we've come this far, so to just demonstrate um, how this works. Um, obviously, free text search provides an autocomplete function, um, which is something that um, sounds like, yeah, of course it does. That's what we're used to it. But again, there's a lot of work behind it um, and a lot of very cl clever people have been working so that um, this autocomplete function works as it is intended. Mm. We can search the data through data providers. So each Ariadne partner is a data provider. Um, and, um, and also, of course, um, using that, we can filter the data by, by publisher, which gives immediately an interesting insights um, into the data that we weren't able to get before. Or if you would want to have something as simple as here, before it would be a whole research that would take, I don't know, months or two months to get uh, information like this. Um, and um, here on the left are two key for archaeology, two key elements for archaeology. We can limit the search um, in, in, in space, in geospatially, and important for archaeology, we can limit our search by date. So in archaeology, it's all about dating. Um, so, yeah, so essentially Ariadne portal is, um, it enables researchers and uh, other others interested in archaeology to browse the catalog using the terms where, when, and what, which covers most of the archaeological questions or the majority of archaeological questions. Um, and now for the end, I will just briefly um, address the, our, the direct cooperation between Slovenia and Argentina that took place within the Ariadne project. Um, um, uh, Slovenian partner is, of course, my institution. And we have the partner from Argentina. I don't speak Spanish, so I will not insult them by reading it out loud. Um, you can read it here on the right. So it's an Institute of Anthropology from um, Cordoba. Mm. And so um, we, the Slovenian partner, um, have been developing uh, one database. It's called Zbiva. It's um, about uh, early medieval finds in um, mostly Slovenia and neighboring countries. Um, and our database is based on Arches. Arches is an open uh, source data management platform specifically developed for heritage field. But just the fact that such a thing exists, so an already existing um, data management platform, doesn't mean that it's very easy to implement. I cannot just download something. It's still, I still need the de developers. And our the Argentinian partner was developing a similar database, and they also decided to use um, Arches as a platform. And so we were able to, um, to join um, we were we would share our experience. Um, they would they uh, found it helpful. They were able to develop things quickly because of that, and they were able to develop it. What at the end is a product that's superior to our product. Um, so now we can um, get some useful feedback um, in our future development. Um, and of course, in a huge project like Ariadne Plus, is there is no work package that says. Um, exchange of experience between partners, um, tick box. This is just something that happens on the site, that happens during coffee breaks in the meetings, and this is how this happened. And this is why such projects are also important. Yes, there's all these pillars and there's all these goals and aims that we, are, we achieve, but there's also these that still cannot be um, replaced um, virtually is this cooperation. So Tim Cook just recently says that innovation is not something you can plan for, which means innovation is not something that you can put in a work package and deliver online. Um, it really helps to, to do it in person. So um, that's all from me. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Stuller. Um, 
since we are a little bit past the time that we have planned for this event and there are no questions, I will try to conclude this uh, today's event. I would really like to thank to all of you to attending for your participation in Luck Day's discussion. Very, very big thank you to all presenters, to participants, to the ambassadors for being with us today. Um, we sincerely hope to see you next year at the next Luck Days 2021, and maybe hopefully if everything goes well here in Ljubljana in Slovenia. Till then, I thank you for being with us. Have a lovely afternoon and evening, and uh, till the next time, goodbye.